Okay, so I, I step back with these respiratory centers, okay? We know that they're in the brain stem, and this is why I gave you the handout, because I don't really believe, I, I can just barely read these. But I wanted to touch base just on that, because I did a little bit more reading in it. And there are other, I only give you the abnustic and pneumotactic respiratory centers, right? Uh, there are others. I just didn't want to leave, leave you short on that. It, I mean, it is an intro. This is an intro to anatomy and physiology, okay? So we have to keep that in mind. But there are other respiratory centers in the, on the brain stem. And also these, uh, you know, like on the quiz, that carotid body was one of them. And the uh, aortic bodies is the receptors. We have receptors, these specialized cells, all over our bodies. Okay, and they they measure gases and pressures and different things. Uh, it would take all year to go into all that, and I would have to study a lot and relearn all these all these different things. And it's it's just not necessary. So what you have to remember is yes, uh, as far as breathing off the level of CO two, that hypercarbonic drive. Okay, we breathe off CO2, and this CO2 is measured throughout the bodies, in the, in the aortic bodies, in the aortic arch, in the carotid bodies at the bifurcation of the carotid artery. There's two places, but there's also places in the brain stem. There's places in, uh, uh -oh, hold on, the tissue, okay? And there's places in, in the cerebral spinal fluid in the head, surrounding your brain, measuring always the carbon dioxide level, acid, acidity level, right? Acidity in the blood. It wants to keep that normal CO2 level 35 to 45, right? So maintain homeostasis. And we'll learn a little bit later on what happens if, if we don't, okay? If we retain CO2 or we expel too much CO2, it becomes a problem. Anyway, just location-wise, here's the abnustic center that we talked about. Uh, there's some chemo recept chemical chemo central chemoreceptors right there. The pneumotactic center that we spoke of right here and right here. So on the brain stem, but there's a couple: the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. Ventral, in this case, meaning below. Okay, so and that you you have that now. And there's other receptors, lung receptors that we have. Uh, the, now I told you um, last uh, last week that we had stretch receptors in the chest, and we do. Okay, that's one. There's many, right? But we also have irritant receptors, and you guys probably living in North Texas are aware of these. Stim it stimulates you to cough. So if something gets in the back of your throat. You know, Texans say, I've had a little pickle in the back of my throat, right? Yeah, I don't know where that came from, but you have a, something, an irritant in the back of your throat, right? And so it's going to stimulate a cough. When that water hits the back of your throat, you think it went down the wrong pipe, it, it stimulates the cough. It hits those vocal cords and makes us cough, okay? So you have a irritant receptors that stimulate the cough, Stretch receptors, like we spoke of, smooth muscles in the airways that decrease the rate and volume. So they measure they don't want to overstretch uh, in, unless there's a demand, right? So stretch receptors there. Just keep in mind that they're in the airways. There are stretch receptors on the thoracic wall. And these J receptors in the al alveoli, and they're sensitive to capillary pressure. This is pretty remarkable because if you draw it for a second, okay, remember you, you have the little air sac coming down and then you have the capillary here and there's blood flow through that capillary, right? Diffusion, okay? And keep in mind that there's a, a fluid in between this alveoli 
in the capillary that this has to diffuse through. Okay. So there's a pressure in here, intravascular pressure, let's say, and there's a pressure out here as well to, to move fluid back and forth. Right. So we'll, that's another for another day. But this is this this J receptor. It's sensitive to this this capillary pressure. That would make more sense when we start talking about congestive heart failure. This will make a lot of sense once once we do that. Okay. So keep that in mind. We we have you you will if you if you get on the mission and you say I want to learn about these receptors, you will go down a path of insanity. Okay. Because they're all just these specialized cells with all these specialized names and they do all these different things. The same way we have pain receptors, you know, and, and we want adult, like if you feel pain, there's different pain receptors for pain medication. Uh, so hypothetically, let's say this Tylenol is, will hook to another certain receptor and ibuprofen looks for an inflammatory receptor. I don't even know if that's a thing or not, by the way. I'm just saying that that's, they, they look at that. Different medicines do different things based on these receptor sites. Uh, some pain medication, okay, just tricks the brain, telling the brain that you're not in pain. It does absolutely nothing to the pain. It just tricks the brain, telling you, hey, you're not in any pain anymore. And so you don't feel the pain. It's not really doing anything to the injury. It's 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 pretty remarkable, but it, it like I said, it leads leads you down a path of, of sort of theory. And like a, one of my medical directors said, it leads you down this path of academics, which sometimes doesn't really coincide with clinical medicine. We don't want to get so academic that we lose uh, track of how to do patient assessment, you know, simple stuff. We want to keep it simple, right? But we do have to learn these things. Okay? So, the ventral respiratory group, anterior, that's what the ant means, right? Initiates impulses to stimulate the in intercostal muscles and diaphragm. So, when it's time to breathe, the, the, the VRG initiates that. There's an initiation. Okay, they work with the other respiratory groups to do that. And then the dorsal, posterior, is an input for depth, 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 right? And rate. So how, how deep we breathe in, what rate we're at, which is not 180, okay? Oh, no, that's respiratory, never mind. That's pulse. And however you say this, how would you say that? Pulse. Pontine respiratory. It's it's actually the pneumotactic center. And it works. This makes a little bit of sense. It works with the VRG to have a smooth transition between inhalation and exhalation. Okay? We if there's different disease processes that there's not a smooth transition between inhalation and exhalation. We'll talk about those at a later date and it messes the respiratory uh, process up. Nice, even, even, good rise and fall of the chest, right? Regular rate, regular volume, regular inhalation. And then it sends uh, impulse to the, v, uh, the VRG to turn off exhalation, meaning that, hey, it's enough. And these, these signals go two to three seconds apart. And that's sort of important because uh, you know, we're like, well, what causes it to turn off and turn on? The stretch receptors play a role in that, okay? But also, these sending these signals play a role in it because we have what's called an I to E time. When we get into the hospital and you have a rotation with respiratory, they'll go around and set, set ventilators. You know, people who are on a vent, savvy that? Vent, vent, ventilators, everybody understand? So, uh, they set an I to E time, inspiration to expiration, inspiration to expiration time. And uh, usually this is like a one to two or two to three, okay? 
and it's how the person, the time between inhalation and exhalation. And we'll get into that a little bit more as well during uh, CPR. We'll talk about that as we, we learn to use the bag valve now. So just a little bit more there, a little bit more information. I didn't want to leave you hanging, thinking that the, the Abnustic and the Newmont Catholic Center controlled everything, but these do do that as well. Then you have this ventilation to perfusion ratio in the v, v, ventilation, right? Ventilation, remember ventilation is the amount of air that we take in with one breath, right? Respiration deals at the gas exchange level. So ventilation to perfusion, the Q is the perfusion. And you can read, it's the ratio between the alveolar ventilation and the perfusion at the capillaries. And it does, it influences gas exchange. Hypoxemia is maybe a new word for you. That's low oxygen, oxygen in the blood. Hypoxia is low oxygen to the tissue, okay, or to the cell. This is in the blood, hypoxemia. If a person has hypoxemia, they, they, uh, it's critical. So the problem with this, with this VQ mismatch, because you want a good exchange between ventilation and perfusion, right? Good gas exchange. So things that mess up this VQ ratio are like clots in the lungs, pulmonary embolisms, fluid, like over here with the little capillary gone. If too much fluid builds up here, as in congestive heart failure, okay, it's going to mess up the VQ ratio because the fact that not as much gas is going to diffuse across that membrane. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So the VQ, uh, V for ventilation, Q for perfusion. And we'll look at this, we'll, we'll talk about, okay, emphysema causes that constriction mucus in the lungs, right, in the airways would cause a VQ mismatch. Some of them are life-threatening, some of them not. And then there's just a little picture that what we want. We want good gas exchange between the tissue and the capillaries. Bring it back, we want good tissue exchange of carbon dioxide uh, and oxygen in the alveolus. Right. Very good, sort of. And, and here's another term as well that you might pick up on. External respiration, right? External respiration is the same as ventilation. It's it's between the atmosphere. No, no, no. External respiration is from the capillary to the alveolus. Okay, it's not the same as ventilation. And the internal respiration is from the capillary to the to the tissue. So put a little star by those two. When we look at, because we'll say systemic, systemic difference, systemic pressures, and different things when we get in. Pulmon, the pulmonary circuit is from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart, right? Pulmonary, that's where uh, it brings blood from the, from the lungs to the heart and out to the systemic system. And then the brings carbon dioxide back to the lungs for uh, elimination. When we see the word systemic, that means system. So the system, okay, it goes out to the, to the different body systems. I've seen that. And then there's this, this thing, you know, when we uh, added this in here, when we talked about how carbon dioxide is, that uh, chloride shift, how carbon dioxide is transported back to the lungs. Remember, it's broken down 70% in bicarb. Uh, only about 23% is attached to the hemoglobin. So it's, and it's broken down into bicarb and when it inside the cell, so when it gets back to the lungs, okay, it, it reforms uh, back into the lungs and CO2 and, it, and it's eliminated. Am I good with that? 
Then look too close, you have a seizure. We've already been over all this. Okay. So, questions there? A little, little clarity on that as far as those respiratory groups are concerned. We won't spend much time on the nervous system. We'll just talk about the two, two types. It, can, uh, it consists of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. This is the central nervous system. And then you have the peripheral nervous system. But we want to look, before we jump off into that, and the different layers. Uh, you have the, the cerebral cortex of the brain. And then directly adhering to the brain is called the pia mater. Mater means mother, okay? Pia, I think, means tender. It's Latin. Go figure those Latins out, right? But it, the pia mater is a layer that directly adheres to the, the brain, the covering of the brain. In between this, you have a subarachnoid space where you have the cerebral spinal fluid. The, the sub subarachnoid vessels are there. We'll talk about uh, subarachnoid bleeds another day. Uh, but there's a space, potential space in here. Cerebral spinal fluid acts as a shock absorber to the brain. It helps with the little shock absorber. But it also measures a, a CO2, a hydrogen ion concentration, acidity. So there's a lot that takes place there. And then in subarachnoid, arachnoid means what? You hear arachnoid, you think of spiders, right? I have a picture that will clear that up in a second. Uh, but remember back in the day, way, way back in the day, when they were cutting people open to, to look at body parts and stuff, I mean, they would have been burned at the stake for doing this when they first started. It was, it was totally off. You would have met, I mean, back in there, you would have never put your hands inside of a body. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a movie out, I mean, it's old, but an Egyptian movie sort of showing that, but uh, where they started all this, and they, they, they got dead bodies, and they did autopsies on them, essentially, and they, they started figuring things out. But, uh, so when they looked at it, they go, you know, what is that? You know, back, you know, sort of like you see on TV, when Native American Indians, they name their kids, they, the chief opens up the teepee and goes, running deer. And they name their kid running deer, right? I mean, so they look at that and they say, oh, rat, a rat noise. Looks, looks like spider web. So a lot of times that's how they get, get the names, okay? But anyhow, so it looks like spider webs. And then you have the dura mater, which means tough mother. This is actually quite a tough layer. It helps protect the brain uh, from, from shock. Uh, it acts as a really good shock absorber. Because what is that, that, that law that we have that talks about energy? You can't <coughs> destroy energy, right? You, only can, you, you can only transfer it. So, if I took this club, and I, wait, this wouldn't do it, hang on a second. If I took this club, and I whacked you in the head with it, for not knowing the normal values of CO2, right? Okay, I'm transferring energy from here to here, correct? Okay, and that energy is going to go through potentially through the skull. You don't want it to, but it can. So you have the bone that's going to absorb a lot of that energy, okay? And then you have the dura mater that's going to absorb that energy. You want to burn that, absorb or burn that energy off before it gets down to the small vessels. Then it will rupture, right? Because when I do that, that, that created energy. Uh, Right? And so that's, it, this table absorbed that energy. Your car does the same thing. You see cars going down the road and they have like a frontal impact on it, right? They have different crumple zones. It's supposed to crumple. The car is supposed to crumple up in these different zones. 
it's protecting you. It's, it's absorbing that energy so it doesn't get to you, right? And the third crumple zone in a car that breaks the motor mounts and the motor should fall on the ground. Okay, so it's, it's a protection. They're supposed to crumple. So when you drive by and you see that nasty little wreck, then you go, oh, that's bad. It may not be that bad because the car is supposed to crumple up uh, for protection. So that's, that's sort of what these different layers do. So you have a little fatty layer and then you have the, the scalp itself, okay? So do commit those to memory, the different layers. And then our picture of the brain again. Uh, so this area, these respiratory areas are complex in this brain stem. They control a lot of, a lot of things with respiration. And then well, you have the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and just another look at the cerebellum. Am I the only person that look on flat? <laughs> Am I the only person that thinks that, or I hope not? But it does look like someone that does squats. I mean, I do want to point out something a little bit more <laughs> important. Okay, on this picture, see this black spot right here? That's where this patient has a stroke. This patient had a stroke. That is dead tissue. If this was on the heart, it would look the same, perhaps but they had a heart attack, right? But this person has had a stroke. That's a significant size there too, depending on what what area it is to the brain. Oh, and there's a better picture of it. The brain and, and then the spinal cord. Down here at the bottom, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce it, but, uh, at the bottom of the spinal cord, which is quite soft, I mean, it's, it's not that hard. You have a lot of spinal nerves coming out the bottom of this spinal cord, and the, the English word for it, translation, is called the horse's tail. Because at the bottom, if you fan, fan out all these spinal nerves at the bottom, it looks like a big bushy horse tail. So that's it's Latin, the, the real word for it is Latin, but it means, in English, it means horsetail. All right, so there's the brain and spinal cord. In October, we'll be picking these up, okay? I wanna correct something as well. I've been adding a, a, a letter in this, in this. It feels sort of silly, but I, I don't know why I got really bored or something. I looked it up. Okay, I did the same thing with. I used to this respiration pattern for diabetes, diabetics. It's a kush, kush small respiration, kush small. For years, I called it kush small. I put an H in there, and finally somebody said, "Hey, there's not an H in there. That's that's kush small, kush small." I'm like, "Oh, okay." Go figure. For 15 years, I've been calling it, you know, something different. Okay. This hole in the bottom of the skull where the brain stem, the spinal cord comes up through, is the foramen magnum. Magnum means big. Okay. Foramen. It's it's actually, a, I, I was, for some reason, I was putting a, a G in there or something. I was trying to put a different letter in there. And when I, you know, I did the little thing with the speaker on it, where it would pronounce it, I'm like, well, that's not that hard to pronounce. For Raymond, almost like ramen. Right? For Raymond, it's F-O, then Raymond, R-A-M-E-N. Go figure. Okay? Easy word. But that's, this is the for Raymond magnum. Okay? I've only been mispronouncing that for 20 years, so... At least caught up. It's not how you start, it's how you finish, right? So now I know how to pronounce it. I feel so much happier. So we got two components of the nervous system. We have the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. 
and the central nervous system is the brain, spinal cord, and spinal nerves, okay? And uh, these control a lot of different functions that we're not really going to get into the different cranial nerves. That we we speak of some that uh, there's a cranial nerve. Everybody stick their tongue out like you do some. I don't know why they did that for pictures. But you know, a lot of people they they stick their tongue out to take a picture. I, I don't know, but anyway. When you stick your tongue out, that's using a cranial nerve. All right, so uh, anyhow, you have the central nervous system, in the, uh, which is the brain, spinal cord, and spinal nerve. The spinal column is protected by the, I mean, the spinal cord is protected by the spinal column, right? The, those big bone structures in there. Then you have sensory nerves and motor nerves. And just like you said, it carries information to the body carries information, uh, sensory nerves carry information from the body to the brain and spinal cord. Motor nerves carry information from the brain back to the body, so it's, it's back and forth. <clears throat> These sensory nerves also are pretty cool because the one thing that you have, and, and you guys all did this in school, that your parents are trying to teach, teach you something hot, right? And when you get close to something really hot, let's say this bottle, it's really hot, okay? And I don't, I don't know it, so I'm going to pick it up. As my hands get closer to it, before I can actually react, before I think, oh, hot, my, my hand is pulling away because of this specialized loop in these motor and sensory nerves. So it's, protect, it's a protective thing. So I go, oh, hot, hot. So I start pulling away before I actually realize that it's hot. The same thing with the blink. When you're driving down the road and that rock comes at you at your windshield, you guys ever experienced that? You blink actually before the rock hits the windshield. The eye picks the rock up and you blink. A blink is a more uh, moistens the eye and also it's protection. That's why we blink. And we blink a lot when our eyes are dry to, to try to get more in there. But the, we, the rock, we, we close our eyes before the rock actually hits the end. So these are, these are specialized nerves. And then, uh, and we'll talk about different nerves at the next, next uh, second period. We'll talk about the vagus nerve because of suction and effect. One of the cranial nerves. And then you have the peripheral nerves, the arms and legs, right? And the periphery, arms and legs out to the side. So, any questions there? I mean, this is a really quick sort of walk through it. Uh, we can't, as of now, doctors, surgeons can't put spinal nerves back together, but they can put peripheral nerves back together. The problem that they have with spinal nerves, I believe it's still the sheath that goes around the spinal nerve. It keeps falling apart. They can attach a hand back together and redo the nerves in the hand, Right? Uh, peripheral nerves. A vascular surgeon would do that. And that equates to like tumor. Okay? So uh, they just haven't figured a way out yet. They're, they're making better. Uh, they're moving forward a lot more over, overseas in Europe, Germany. Have you heard about uh, this one? Doctor who tried to do a brain transplant. A what? A brain transplant. It's on TV. Probably killed the person that was going to do it. Uh, I can't, I can't, I've never heard anything about that. Here's some nerves uh, <clears throat> that run down the arm. We'll talk about these nerves here when we talk about vital signs, okay? We want to make sure that we're, we don't pump that blood pressure cuff up too much, okay? 
So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But there's, these are a lot of peripheral nerves that run down through there. A lot of nerves in the shoulder. I mean, you have what's called referred pain, where it, it hurts a different location, but it's something else. Okay? So it may hurt up here in the shoulder, but the injury is actually in the elbow, essentially. So it may hurt down here in the elbow, and the injury is up up here. It's it's uh, we'll we'll look at that briefly as we as we run across these things. I, I'll show you this. What is this? Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, they they would know it. They say, "Oh, that's like golfer's elbow is pain here, right?" But it's actually caused from this ligament up here. They they they, they can figure out that it's nerve pain that's radiating from from somewhere else. So, like that nerve pain, uh, what kind of test would they use for for determining that? A very expensive nerve test. And that's what they call a nerve test. I just don't have one done, done on my shoulder. And they casually called me to set up the appointment and casually said, oh yeah, and, and this procedure is $700. Oh with your insurance. I'm like, <laughs> no thank you. Because they were going to tell me wow. that I had nerve pain. I already knew that. <laughs> okay? So I, I said, I don't need you to tell me I have nerve pain. I already know it. I need you to tell the doctor how to fix it. So, anyway, we'll, let's watch this overview right quick of the, the GI tract, okay? Whoops, that didn't work. Before I click this button, is any questions over the, the brief, very brief nervous system that we talked about? Okay. Hi Andrew Wolf here. In this video I'm going to uh, provide an introduction and overview of the physiology of the gastrointestinal system. So the gastrointestinal system um, includes uh, the uh, GI tract, which is a tube that goes from mouth to anus, and then organs that are also involved with, um, with the GI system, including the liver, and you can see tucked back behind here, the pancreas. Now, this picture here is a picture of an adult human that has a nice, well-developed, normal um, GI tract. But I want to start out with the story of the embryo. Now, remember, I talked in previous videos about how when we are born, um, we have, we start out as a tri, uh, trilaminar germ disc, and on one side of the disc we have the ectoderm, and the other side we have the endoderm, and then everything in the middle is the mesoderm. Now, this disc wraps around, and we become a hollow tube. So very early on in life, we are essentially a hollow tube. So you can sort of picture it now. Actually, I probably could draw it in three dimensions here like this. I'll we'll give you the cutaway view. And that's the two going down the middle. Okay. So, um, we are essentially a hollow tube, and interestingly enough, we are interacting with the environment on the outside through our senses, our eyes and our nose, and our skin. And on the inside, through the endoderm, we are also interacting with the environment because we take the environment into this inner tube. So we are interacting with the environment on the inside. And, um, you know, I think it's just important to recognize um, that even though 
we are taking food into this inner tube, it is still part of the external environment. Okay. And one of the play ways that this becomes very clear is because this external environment is filled with bacteria. So, with that concept in mind, um, the overall purpose of the gastrointestinal tract is to interact with the environment in such a way to, that supports the growth, development, and survival of the organism. Okay, so how does this hollow tube, this gastrointestinal tract, interact with the environment to support the organism? Well, it's, it does so by digesting food, which means, you know, things that we take into the mouth, the top of the tube. Digesting is the process of breaking down nutrients so that they can be absorbed, and then absorbing those nutrients. Absorption. And then the metabolism. Um, and that means both breaking down and building new, um, new things. And this primarily occurs in the liver where we synthesize the proteins and where we are synthesis where we are breaking down complex carbohydrates and creating new um, usable forms of carbohydrates, in particular glycogen. And the same process with lipids. And then also excretion. We are removing back into the environment, out of our internal environment and into the external environment, um, things that are a threat to the organism. So wastes. And through the GI tract, this means, you know, food that we can't food stuff that we can't digest. And it also means a number of toxins, including ammonia, uh, bile, some heavy metals. And there's some other things too. There's also many things that are excreted through the uh, through the urinary tract as well. So these are the major functions and how the GI tract is interacting with the external environment to support the, uh, the organism. And some other functions that it performs in order to um, perform these functions is secretion. So for instance, it secretes saliva in the mouth to um, start the digestion process and to aid in mobility of the uh, food bolus down into the uh, lower GI tract. And it secretes um, acid and enzymes in the stomach and more enzymes um, and bicarb in the duodenum and a bunch of other things that, and all, they are all through aid, digestion, and absorption in the GI tract. And then there's motility that also aids in the absorption um, by bringing things close to the absorption, absorptive surfaces of the GI tract and excretion. So, Secretion and motility are important functions, but they are here to support the main functions that um, help the organism survive. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, we'll just give a broad overview and introduction to the various elements of the GI tract. So the GI tract, again, is this hollow tube that starts up in the mouth where we take food in travels down the esophagus, goes through the stomach, uh, down through the du duodenum, and into the jejunum, and then 
through the ilium, and then I'll, I'll skip here through the colon and up the anus. So we start our pathway here in the mouth where we are taking in food. So the functions of the mouth are to masticate food, to break up large chunks into small chunks to aid digestion. And also in the mouth, we have saliva that is being mixed in with food, food during the process of mastication. And this is the moisten. The food is 99.5% water. Um, so really moistening is an important function of saliva and also help, that helps to hold the food together in a bolus that can travel through the GI tract via peristalsis. And saliva also has enzymes that begin digestion. And it has immunologically active chemicals, including um, immunoglobulin A and some lysozymes and peroxides that help to kill off some microorganisms and also protect the teeth. Okay, now the esophagus really is just a, has a function of transport. The esophagus is a very interesting organism, organ I should say. It's a very interesting organ because of the way that it transports, and I'm not going to talk too much about the esophagus um, here, except when we get into talking about the physiology of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, but it really is an organ that only provides one function, and that's motility. Um, then we have the GE junction here, and that moves us into the stomach. The stomach sort of churns to break up chunks more, and um, it does this through mechanical churning. The um, stomach is an extremely strong organism, and you know I recently listened to a, uh, a radio interview of a woman that was um, that was looking at uh, fistulated cows. And fistulated cows are these cows that have um, a hole that's sort of built into their side so people can study their digestion. So what you have is this hole here. This is, that is sort of made in the cow's stomach sur surgically that goes out through the side. And the reporter was actually um, talking about the experience of putting his hand in to the fistula and feeling the stomach and was amazed at just how strong um, the mechanical forces were in, in the cow's stomach. The, the stomach churns quite forcefully and this actually breaks up food into pieces. And then there are obviously chemical components here. There are enzymes and the enzymes are aided with these and particular enzymes are aided um, in, by the low pH within the stomach. So we also have the acid secretion as well. Then, so the stomach is very acidic with a pH of around one. Then in, as we pass through into the duodenum, then we start to uh, see the role of the pancreas. As you can see, the pancreas here drains into the duodenum. And one of the first things that, that you need to recognize in the duodenum is we have the pH that goes from 1 up to near 8. And it does this because the pancreas is secreting a lot of bicarb. And then also, the digestion continues because of uh, pancreatic enzymes. And these enzymes include um, things that break down um, proteins, proteases, and 
the starches. And it also has some things that break down fats. More importantly though, also here in the duodenum, through the common bile duct, we have the gallbladder that is releasing bile acids. And these bile acids um, break large globules of fat down into tiny globules of fat that are suspended within um, the liquid medium of contents, contents of the duodenum. And then as we pass through into the, um, into the jejun and the ilium, we have absorption. And this process continues throughout the small intestines. Um, and then we move into the um, to the colon. Now the colon, um, the major function of the colon is to store and then excrete waste. The waste that has sort of been accrued throughout the rest of the GI tract. And, and all, also is water absorption. And this is this is very important because the GI, the colon has a significant role in, in maintaining the water balance and electrolyte balance in the body by um, changing the amount of water that is absorbed as, um, as fecal matter passes through the colon. Okay, so this brings my uh, brief video overview of the gastrointestinal system to an end. Um, in my next video, I am going to talk about the anatomy of, of the gut, including the layers of the gut, and the physiology of the gut, um, particularly focused. Okay, so we'll, we'll pick some of this up. Okay, uh, so what we what we want to look at is sort of here back to this picture. The esophagus. I mean, we swallow food. We get that, right? I mean, we chew it. We break it down. The saliva helps break down. It, it's the saliva is part of the, the the beginning of the digestion, right? We swallow food, but it just doesn't drop. It doesn't free fall down to the stomach and splash down into the acid in the stomach. It may look cool, but it be doing that but it doesn't it uses this and someone google the spelling peristalsis peristalsis is like a snake eats okay has everyone ever saw a snake eat like they get it and it just the little bunny that's now in the snake the snake's belly it sort of pulls it like like there look at a snake during break look at a snake eat and then how it pulls it in and that's what it does, is the esophagus essentially grabs hold of it and pushes it down through peristalsis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, okay? And it drops, it comes down into the stomach and then the stomach turns and breaks it down, okay? But this peristalsis starts from beginning to end. It, it continues through the digestive system, the small and large uh, intestine, okay? What we want to know before uh, is before we go to the hospital at least is the location and function of all the organs okay so there's not that many we, we know the majority of them so the like the liver the liver is primarily used for filtration it does other things but primarily it filters blood okay the stomach breaks down food this duodenum in yeah, there you go. These are the first two small sections of the small intestine where uh, digestion actually begins. Okay, so we, we take with, with the liver and the gallbladder, remember the gallbladder excretes bile, B-I-L-E, to break down fats. You can live without your gallbladder. Most everybody that, how many of you guys are female? Oh, the majority. What? So about 40-ish. 50-ish, you will probably have your gallbladder removed. It's, it's just women have a high instance of having their gallbladder removed. Huh? I, I don't know. They just do. They, they do. They, they have that. Uh, sort of goes along with they build up gallstones and I don't know, but 
you see a lot you see a lot more women having their gallbladder removed than men. Anyways, it, it excretes this bile to aid in digestion. The pancreas is over here as well. In the pancreas, part of the job of the pancreas is to uh, uh, secrete digestive enzymes. It helps with digestion. The part that we look at the most is it uh, produces insulin to break down glucose. So digestion takes place in the small intestines, and then we go into the large intestines, the colon. You have the ascending, transverse, descending colon, colon. And like I said, that's just like Andrew Wolf said, which you will grow there. Just like that name. Uh, it's, it's like a poop factory. It just stores the stuff that we're going to secrete. But mainly, a lot, well, not mainly, but part of it is, hey, it, a, 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 it aids in water balance. Right? Electrolyte balance. It's important. You know, when a patient has diarrhea, the definition for diarrhea is the inability to absorb water. Connects, right? Think about it. You know? So, uh, one problem with someone that has a lot of diarrhea is they lose a lot of water and they, they become dehydrated. You don't want to do that. So, anyhow, we'll talk about the, the pieces, the, the different organs as we come up on it, I just wanted you guys to have an overview. He keeps using the term bicarb. Bicarb absorbs acid. So like a big Tums, in a way. Bicarb is secreted in the body. Uh, it's called the base excess, which secretes bicarb sort of to absorb some acid. And then the normal pH of the blood is 7.35 to 7.45. See the 35 and 45 for the CO2, and uh, anything less than 7.35 is considered acidic. Anything on the other side is alkaline. And as we run into these different things to talk about blood pH, we we will. All right. And then there's the different parts. Digestion is sort of complicated in itself, but we don't really get into that this much in there. There's a doctor, specialist, gastroenterologist that deals with the gastrointestinal tract. You know, people who are having problems with the GI tract, they may have to go to a, a gastroenterologist uh, for help. And there's all this. October, we'll see this. We'll, we'll hold the, if they still have it out, we'll hold the stomach and the, and the intestines and everything. So we'll, we'll see that firsthand. And it'll be, it'll be a little bit more, it'll be easier to remember once, once we start looking at the organs, okay? We'll come back to this. That's pretty funny. That's a chocolate chip my drink from Starbucks, but we'll, we'll come back to it. All right, questions? Isn't it true that if, like, your body can't really, like, like, it's immune to some medicines, like the medicines that you take doesn't affect you that well, that 